Hebrews chapter 3. I've titled this, Consider Jesus and Find Your Rest in Him. Because that's what the writer of Hebrews is trying to get through to the Jews that he's writing to, the Jewish believers here. So in chapter 1, 2, 1 and 2, we've looked at Jesus uh, is God and that he's greater than angels and that he's... Uh, the earth is uh, subject to him completely and to man, and he's the son of man. And we've just seen the picture of Jesus that uh, has been presented by the writer of Hebrews. But in chapter 3, he's going to talk about how Jesus is greater than Moses. Uh, and, and to the Jews, Moses was the great prophet, um, someone that they highly looked up to. Uh, it would be hard to believe uh, for some of the Jewish believers that Jesus was greater than Moses because Moses gave the law and Moses led the nation of Israel out of Egypt and, and all that was there. Um, but the writer of Hebrews is trying to show the Jews uh, that Jesus is greater than that. Let's look at it. Uh, verse 1, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, you know, as we look at that right there, he says, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling. So he's writing to the Jewish believers, uh, but yet this is the word of God written to us in just the same. So who he's talking to literally is you who have been set apart by God through Jesus Christ. Holy brethren, you who have been set apart by God through Jesus Christ partakers of a heavenly calling. So we who share in the same invitation of service to God. So what he's showing there is it's not just Jesus Christ. It's not just religion. We come to Christ and we become born again to an active service for God through Christ. That means no one is to be born again and then go sit on their duff for the rest of their life as a Christian. There's a labor to accomplish. There's a work to do to every believer. And that's what he's showing here. He says, uh, holy brethren, um, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling. We have been called by God into a labor. And he says, consider Jesus uh, the apostle and high priest of our confession. So to consider Jesus, it just means to, to take time to fully observe Jesus. Don't just take a second, look at him and move on, but take some time. In fact, the wording here to consider, uh, it's the same word used by the Apostle Paul in, in, in the book of Acts when he's on a Roman ship and they're looking for a safe harbor to pull the ship into because it's a storm, it's a really bad storm, and they're looking deeply, intently for a harbor that's safe for them. That's the word consider. I think we use it today in a simple way. You know, consider the patriots or consider this. And No, it's a deep, deep word of searching, looking deeply into for safety, for security. Um, so, so what he's saying is, you know, you who have been set apart by God through Jesus Christ, we who share in the same invitation of service to God, um, take time to fully observe and discover Jesus. And then he drives it home, the apostle and high priest of our confession. So the apostle would be, he is the only ambassador of God's love for us. The only one given by God to demonstrate and show us God's love for us. 
This is Jesus. He is the only one who can give us God's love because he fully represents God's love for us. He's the apostle and the high priest. So he's the only mediator between God and man. There is no other one. And that's what he shows there. He is the only one who can go before God for us. Even though we had a high priest overseeing the Jewish nation for years who interceded for the nation, um, he only did it part-time. He only did it temporarily. Then there'd be another one, and then there'd be another one. Jesus is the only one, permanent, full. That's what he's showing there. Of our confession. So to, to our confession means to publicly declare a belief and adhere to it. So Jesus is our public and private profession he's our public and private adherence he's our public and private loyalty to god he's our public and private devotion before god so what the writer of hebrews is saying here is that our profession of christ as lord of our lives has it adhered to it a devotion of deeds and labor in Christ. There's something God saved us for, and there's something he wants us to do. And the simplicity of it is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not sharing, you know, to, to come to church, come to church. No, share Christ with somebody. Church, how, how, church can't save anybody. Only Jesus can. And he's trying to show the Jews, get your eyes on Jesus it's not about our religion that we can accomplish. It's not about, it's even not even about if, if I were to be devoted to prayer three times a day to God and I'm going to develop a strong spiritual life. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. He's the one who intercedes before God for me. He's the one who shows me God's love. And he is the only one who can do it. So, so if my profession is true, then it will have with it a substance that goes beyond human nature. If my profession of Christ is true, there'll be a core essence of deeds and labor in Christ, both in my public life and my private life. That's what he's showing them. There's going to be something. You're going to want to do something for the one who saved you. You're going to want to share his love. You're going to want to do something for him so that's why he's saying to consider jesus there then in verse 2 he was faithful to him who appointed him as moses also was in all his house for he has been counted worthy of more glory than moses by just so as much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house for every house is built by someone but the builder of all things is god now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. That would be Christ. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are. That's what he's saying. Uh, if we hold fast our confidence in the boast of our hope uh, firm until the end. So, so what he's saying here in verse 2, he was faithful to him who appointed him as Moses was also, uh, over his house. So Jesus was absolutely faithful to redeem all persons committed to him, as Moses was to those who followed the commandments of the Lord. Moses was a servant in the house of God. Jesus is God, right? So he's, he's the son in whom the house belongs to it. It's built for him. What he's showing is Jesus has supremacy than Moses. It would be like if I if I was invited to go to a mansion and on the way there I get picked up by a friend and I'm headed to this enormous mansion and as I get there I find out that I've, I've been invited to this mansion by the servants of the mansion and because they know my dad or something like that so then they would take me and I'd be thinking wow I'm gonna go in this mansion and, and I may take a left and go into the bunkhouse over there and I'm like why can't I go in the mansion well because I'm just the servant of the mansion I don't own the mansion. I invited you to come here, stay with me, so you can come with me, and you can look. And then I'd look at the at the the horses in the corral, and I'd like, I want to ride one of those horses. Well, you can't ride it. I'm just a servant here. It's the owner that owns the horses. He can't. But if I'm there and I kind of bump into the owner's son, and we become really good friends, then the son says to me, "Come on into the mansion." 
And I walk into the mansion. Wow. You're like, come on into the kitchen. Open up the fridge. Grab some food. Let's take a ride on a horse. I can do that because now the son is the owner of the house, not a servant. So Moses was a picture of what was to come. And Jesus Christ is what came. So he is now, God has come and said, come into my home. You're my child. You're an heir now to the kingdom of heaven, to the throne of God's grace. Not just part-time, full-time. So it's all about him. And that's what he's showing there is that, that Moses was just a servant, um, so Jesus is not greater than, I mean, Moses is not greater than Jesus. Uh, the son has greater liberty than a servant. Moses was just a servant of the Lord. Jesus is the master. He's God. You know, Moses led the people of God out of Egypt towards the land of Canaan. That was the promised land. That symbolized the place of God's rest for his people. So the rest and peace God wants all of us to experience is going to be through faith in Jesus Christ. Moses led the people towards a symbol of the rest of, rest of God. Rest. So, but Jesus leads his people to the actual place of rest, which is himself. Who's Jesus drawing someone to? Himself. So that he has become my rest. It doesn't lack labor. I think a lot of people think that rest means to not do anything or to be at ease. But the word rest here means to labor without intermission with calm peace. It literally means to labor for the Lord in the strength in which the Lord supplies. And by doing that, you'll have a calm peace in spite of any circumstance you face. You do it in the strength God supplies. Christ is my peace. So I get a job, I go to work, and I labor hard for the glory of God. And whether it's like sweeping a floor or making boxes or inserting ice into little packages, you do it for the glory of God. I'm there for your glory, Lord, in the strength in which you supplied. And then my life becomes then what? I become an ambassador of Christ, showing people Christ. I don't show people a rest, uh, a, a future rest they could have, but a rest they can have now in Him because I find my rest in Him. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is trying to say. Look at verse 6. But Christ was faithful as a son over His house, whose house we are if we hold fast our confidence in the boast of our hope firm until the end. Uh, these words are misinterpreted many times by many people. Um, they're not to be understood as, the, as a condition of the former statement. You know, uh, what it means is whose house we are. That, what he's saying here is you and I who understand and know that Christ now dwells in us by faith, you and I who actually believe that can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And I can use my newfound freedom of speech and boldness at the throne of God's grace. I've been invited to the throne of grace. You have been, you who believe, have been invited to the throne of God's grace to freely go and open our mouths and talk to Him and speak to Him. Lay our burdens down at his feet. Uh, intercede for other people and all of that. That's what Christ has done for us. And, and so the, the statement, whose house we are. This is who we are. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. So then, so then I have a holy confidence of interest in the love of God and the salvation of Christ. And I can go on in the exercise of the graces that God has given me to the end of my days. Why? It's not about me. It's about His faithfulness over my life that keeps me. That's what the point, the writer of Hebrews is trying to drive home to the Jewish Christians who are going back to Judaism because they don't feel Christianity anymore. They don't feel like it's accomplishing anything. You know, it, it's not about feeling. It's about faith in Christ. 
and I can get up every day of my life and have that living, confident hope and, and be interested in the love of God and in the salvation of Christ, I can do that for the rest of my life because it's not about me. It's not about how religious I am. It's not about how holy I am. It's not about how, how I can purify myself to be the most perfect Christian in the world and I can, like I said, pray three times a day and just do all this religious work. It's been accomplished completely. And it's not been accomplished by a substitute, Moses, who was a picture of something to come. It's been completely accomplished by Jesus Christ for you and I. Nothing more needs to be added in any way, shape, or form. It's his faithfulness over my life that keeps me, not mine. That's the whole point he's making there. Look at verse 7. Therefore, or because of that, just as the Holy Spirit says... Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And he quotes here Psalm 95. And it's an awesome picture because he's showing the Jews right here how it was uh, when they hardened their hearts to God. Even though they saw and experienced his works, okay, what did they see? They, they watched Moses lead them out of Egypt. They all walked through the Red Sea and they saw, the Bible says that it was like a wall of water on each side. They passed through it on dry land. They watched God close the ocean on the Egyptian army and destroying the whole Egyptian army. They watched bodies float up on the shore. They marched right off down into the, headed to the, to the promised land. They, they watched what God did. They, they had no food or they were hungry. They wanted meat. God brought quail and he gave them manna. They saw it all with their eyes. And yet they did not believe in their hearts. That's what he's saying. They, they got to the, to the promised land and, and what Moses sent spies inside and they went to spy the land and they came back. You remember the story? And there's 10 spies and they come back and they go, listen, it's a, yeah, it's a land that's filled with milk and honey, all right. And the grapes are the size of basketballs and, and this, but guess what? The people are greater than us. And the people are so powerful. And the people, and then Caleb and, and uh, Joshua said, said, no, God will do this. He'll take it. We can trust him. He'll bring us into the land. And yet, and yet the spies were a greater voice. The, the ones that, that, they were a greater voice, and, and it brought unbelief into the people. And so he's trying to say, remember that? And, and for 38 years, you wandered in the wilderness, for 38 years, the longest death march in human history. For a, God waited for a whole generation to die that did not believe him so that he could bring the younger generation into the promised land. And that's exactly what he did. And that's why he says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Okay, so today. So what he's saying is, so now, therefore, at this present time, right now, he says, if you hear his voice, and it means here hearing it not only externally, um, but internally, so as to understand it and distinguish it from a stranger's voice, and then approve of it and believe it and put to practice what was heard. Today, if you hear his voice, not just on the outside, on the inside, and you can discern, yes, this is the voice of God. It's not me. And he's giving me direction. He's showing me a path. He's showing me to walk and to trust him, to find my rest in him. He's showing me to labor for his glory. He's showing me these things. He say, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. It means don't turn a deaf ear to the calls and counsels of Christ. And it's a heartbreaker because I watch people do it. And some of you have seen people do it. 
You talk with them and you bring them back to the Lord and you show them Jesus Christ and, they, and they've grown up knowing about him and they get to this place in their life and they go, I just can't hear you anymore. I'm just too busy. I got too much going on. There's too much sin in your life. That's why. Can't hear him because of sin. Stop. Consider Jesus. It's, it's hard in today's day and age to tell a younger generation that don't even give a thought about Jesus Christ to stop and consider Jesus and find your rest in him. It's difficult, and it, and it takes prayer uh, now to be able to even see that wall broke down. But he's saying, do not, you know, don't refuse to listen to the word of God as God is speaking through the Holy Spirit to you. Don't willingly walk in unbelief is what he's saying. Don't do that. Uh, unbelief, unbelief is a strong word too because it means infidelity, means unfaithfulness, disloyalty, and betrayal. Unbelief is actually, uh, it's a word that was part of the Jewish marriage vows um, to, to neglect and willingly violate a vow. Um, that's what it means to, to break the vow that you made in marriage. Um, so he says, you know, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me. Then he goes through the whole walk and says, that's what they did to me. They, they turned their back on me. They packed up and they didn't want to hear a word I was saying anymore, which is pretty sad. Um, so in looking for rest, you know, laboring for the Lord and the strength that God supplies brings a calm peace in spite of circumstances. He's saying they hardened their hearts, they provoked the Lord, they tried me, they tested me, they scrutinized me to their own approval is what it means. It means they said things like, you know, God, you, you won't do what I want, so I really don't have time for you. I've been asking you for years. You need to do this in my life. And you need to do this in my life. And you need to do this in my life. And you haven't answered one of those things. You haven't done one thing I have asked you to do. Well, God's not a genie there to do as you please. He's there for you to do as he pleases. It's a whole different ballgame. So, so that's what he's trying to show them. Um, the attitude of their heart turned them away from the very rest that they desired. And in turning away from that rest, they turned away from the very labor the Lord wanted them to do in their lives. And it's what they want to do. We just got done going through Jeremiah and Lamentations, and we're going through Ezekiel on Wednesday nights. And what have we learned? All right? So, so the people were laboring religiously, without any heart towards God at all. So they were following through with the religious motions, but they were missing the intimacy of a walk with God. And God kept calling them on it and said, repent, turn from that kind of way and turn back to me. Come back to me. He said it over and over and over and over again, generation after generation. Um, and what were the people saying? You're not doing what I want. Lord, when will you finally do what I ask you? And that was the attitude of the people. And, and God brought judgment down upon them. And they never had the rest that they so desired that God had waiting for them. So the picture painted, um, I guess you could say, was like Matthew eleven twenty eight, when Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know, when Jesus said that, he didn't say, come to me so you can take it easy. No, he said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. What he's saying is, I'm not going to take away your labor because that labor is very important to me. But if you come to me and if you'll trust me, I will be the strength you need to accomplish the labor that's before you, and I'll be the rest you need as you labor. That's why he went on to say, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. 
For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So the writer of Hebrews is trying to show the Jews it's not our religious labor that's going to get us closer to God or, 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 or get us in good standing with God. That's all been fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And ours is to consider Jesus Christ, to look deeply into Him, to trust in Him, to find our rest in Him. Yes, to labor for the glory of God and the calm peace that Christ gives and to press on in that, uh, and to never back off from that. Look at verse 12. It says, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is, as is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So he goes right into this warning now. Showing them this is Jesus. Look to him. It's Jesus. Trust in him. It's not about Moses and not going back to the law. It's not about going back to Jewish traditions. It's about looking to Jesus Christ. And then he gives this warning. Take care, brethren. All right. My beloved brethren, us who love the Lord together, take care that none of you, that may not be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Mean, meaning, take care. Don't allow unbelief to become the prominent force in your soul. I know precious Christian brothers that I love very much that allow unbelief to be the prominent force in their soul. It's not about my sin. That's covered. It's I'm forgiven. It's about I believe in my heart. And that belief has an active labor that shows that it, I, I labor now for the glory of God, not for the glory of Ron. But to walk in unbelief in my heart, to say with my mouth, I love the Lord, but to believe in my heart, let that be the prominent force in my soul, to not believe, he's saying, that, that falls away from the living God, okay? Then I would remove myself in disgust and detest of myself withdrawing myself from the living God. The implication here is the fellowship of God's people, the place where God dwells in their midst. If I walk around and I'm going to walk in unbelief as calling myself a believer, but yet I'm not going to believe that God's great enough to wash my sin away. I'm not, I'm, it's got to be some kind of religious work that I just can't seem to accomplish in my life. There's no other way that I can feel good about myself or whatever the case is. He's saying if you're going to walk that way, then you will, of your own power, remove yourself in disgust and detest of yourself. You'll remove yourself from God's people. And you'll find yourself out there somewhere. Why? Because you're all fixed on you, not Jesus. And, and it's getting someone back to Christ. Sh show them Jesus Christ. Consider Jesus. He is your rest. So, so there's a warning here to guard ourselves from taking over God's way in our life um, so that we don't willingly violate the vow that we made before him by being unfaithful and disloyal and by walking in infidelity. That's what it means. Strong wording, but there's a warning here. Don't go back to some religious work. Walk with Christ. Trust in him. In verse 13, but encourage one another day after day as long as it's still called today, so none of you will harden, be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. All right, so learn to forsake yourself by stirring up one another as long as you've been given today so that none of you turn to some future false promise of safety and happiness. Don't do it. It's never greeter on the other side of the septic tank, is it? Ever. And yet somehow we get down that road in our life and we think, well, the Joneses, they're always happy and look what they got. Oh, these people, look at all that. They have this strong faith and look at them and look at, they're so good and they're so godly and they're so religious <clears throat> and I'm so bad and I, and I can't stand. Stop. That's unbelief. 
That's not believing in your heart that Jesus accomplished it all. Jesus, we sing the song, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. His blood poured over and washed us clean. And we stand blameless before God Almighty in such a way that this wretched sinner that's sitting on this stool in front of you has the right as an heir to the throne of God's grace. And so do you. I can go to that throne at any time and cry out to him. And he hears me. Why? Because I'm so religious? No. Because I pray three times a day? No. Because the blood of Jesus Christ has accomplished that road for me to walk. And the writer of Hebrews is telling the Jews, don't forget that or you will drift away in peril and you will find yourself walking in unbelief. And, and strong wording there, but very, very important that they understand that. And, and, and again, the picture uh, painted um, in Numbers chapter 13 when the writer of Hebrews is kind of reminding them when he says, it's still called today, so none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Um, don't make the same mistake your fathers made at Kadesh Barnea when they were going to go into the promised land and the spies came back and gave them this big thing. Uh, he's saying, don't do that. Don't walk in unbelief. Don't be so focused on your inadequacy, but on Jesus Christ. It was God's sufficiency. Keep your eyes on him. Verse 14, he says, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. While it is said, and again, he says it again, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, for, for who provoked him when they all had heard? Indeed, did not all of those who came out of Egypt led by Moses and with whom he is angry for 40 years, was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able uh, to enter because of unbelief. So what he's showing them here in verse 14 down through, we've become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. Uh, so we, we are being loved by God. We are given over to him and chosen in him before the foundation of the world. If I'm born again and I'm a believer in Christ, then God knew before the foundation of the world was laid that I would come to him that I would trust in him. And he also kn knew that, that I would hold fast that faith in Christ as the assurance of my salvation. I guess the, the, the whole point that's being made here is your religious works will never be the assurance of your salvation. It is your faith in Christ alone that is your assurance of salvation. I know I'm going to be with my Lord for all of eternity because of what he accomplished for me, period. And no other labor that I can do religiously. I'm not going to go be with Jesus Christ for eternity because I'm a pastor or because I went to school to learn to study the Bible I'm, or because I do some kind of great religious work. And he's saying... That's not it. It's, it's because of what he did. And because of what he did, I can hold fast that the assurance of my salvation is by faith in Christ, in the blood of Christ. And that's why he says in verse 15, he says it again. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me. So, so he says again, now at this present time, I'll say it again. And it should be said every single time we sit down and walk through the word. Today, if you hear his voice, today, do you hear him? If you hear him, not just externally. So externally would be right now I'm reading God's word. True? I'm saying it. So what are you hearing? Ron's word or God's word? God's word. So you're hearing his voice. When I read his word today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. You just heard externally his voice. Now, do you hear it internally? 
That's what he's saying. Right now, at this present time, there is not one human being that God would not speak to internally. He offers himself to everyone. The Bible says Jesus knocks on the door of what? Every single heart. And says, if you open up, I'll come in and dine with you. We'll talk internally. We'll work this out. I'll show you who I am. I'll save your soul. I'll wash your sins away. Let me in. Let me in. To some, I think, he pleads, please, let me in. This is your last call. I know where your life is going. Please, let me in. Do you hear him internally? So he's saying, if you hear his voice, do not turn a deaf ear to the call and counsel of Christ. Don't refuse to listen to the word of God as God speaks through the Holy Spirit to you. Don't willingly walk in unbelief inside. And it's always an internal work that God does in us before there's any external work at all. He moves in and he begins to clean house and he begins to reveal sin and he begins to show me a direction that he wants me to, to walk and to trust in him while this process is happening in my life. That's sanctification. So, so he's shown them that picture. So you have the nation of Israel had refused to listen to God. So they ended up hardening their hearts. And instead of trusting God himself, they trusted in their own religious works. And they believed they were okay because they felt good about themselves in the labor they were laboring in. And God, for generation after generation after generation, was trying to show them, it's not about this work. I gave you a sacrificial system to show you what was to come. And here's my son, Jesus Christ. Listen to him. He is the fulfillment of that whole sacrificial system. So now come to me through him. And what, it, what does it say? They were never able to enter into his rest for, for them because of unbelief. Because they refused to believe inside. Well, I'm not good enough. Well, I'll never be good enough. Don't listen to the lie. But the truth is, none of us will ever be good enough. True? It's his goodness. So instead of getting caught up in unbelief and saying, I'll never be good enough. I'll never be right enough. I'll never be holy enough. I'll never be set apart enough for you to use me, Lord. Start saying, Lord, you're so good. You're such an awesome God that you would love someone like me, that you would forgive me, that you would give me a brand new life to live. Show me how to live it for you. It's an attitude of the heart. It always will be, always, uh, when, and the rubber hits the road in that spot. So when you read chapter 3, it's a warning, I guess, um, for the Jews and for us that it's, it would be easy for us to walk the same way they did. It would be easy for us to harden our hearts and resist the rest that we have as believers in Christ because we can, by our own stubborn religious will, become disloyal to Christ and walk in unbelief and willingly become fickle and false. It's an easy road to walk down. And we have been given each other to encourage each other. If, we see, if I see you starting to go down that road, I'm going to say something to you. If you see me starting to go down the road, you say something to me. Why? We're all in this together. And we're all walking this walk. And we're walking it by what? By faith in Christ. And we press on in that way. Why? Because he accomplished it. He did it for us so that we can walk that path. What did we see last week? He cleared the way. He cleared a way so well that I can walk by faith trusting him now because he's accomplished it completely. So the writer of Hebrews showing strong words here. It's not about us. It's not about you. It's not about how much you pray or how spiritual you are. It's not about how faithful you are or how godly you are. It's all about Jesus. 
It is about His faithfulness. It is about His goodness. It's about His love for us. It's about His ministry towards us. And ours is to believe by faith just how good He is. We started this walk of Christianity, every one of us began a walk of Christianity by faith. And God desires every one of us to end it by faith and to walk straight through that life by faith in Christ. The rest will come. The labor will come in the strength that God supplies. And we, we lean upon Him for that. But, but it's, it's trusting in Him and learning to lean upon Him and finding rest in Him. And it's all about Him. And that's really, I think, we're going to see that in every single chapter of the book of Hebrews because the book of Hebrews is all about Jesus Christ. It is about His faithfulness, His righteousness, His goodness. We should be the, the very people that when it's time to praise the Lord, we put our hands up and say, praise your goodness. You're so good, Lord. You're so good to me. I, I'll sing of that for the rest of my life because you are good, Lord. And it's again, it's an attitude of the heart. In the, in the book of Jude, verses 24 and 25, Jude writes, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to make you stand in the presence of His glory, blameless and with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. Good words. Good words that we hold on to. So, so Hebrews chapter 3, consider Jesus and find your rest in Him. And He'll see you through. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank You for this time You've given us to spend in Your Word. Lord, You're so good. You're so great towards us. We love You. We thank You. We praise Your holy name, and we just lift it all up to You. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.